deepest embrace. And in the ultimate expression of oiktirmas, Jesus is moved by compassion to enter into humanity's suffering, into death itself, to rescue and bring us near to God. And it's this same life of compassion that Jesus calls his followers to imitate, allowing ourselves to be moved by the pain of others, to embrace the hurting, and to participate in relieving suffering in the world. In this way, we too can embody the compassion of Yahweh, or in Jesus' words, be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. Now you can see how fitting it is that compassionate is the first word God uses to describe himself. So when we're in pain or see others suffering, we can be certain that God is deeply moved to respond and that he's there to meet us with his deep compassion. Good morning, welcome, and happy Mother's Day. Uh, Just a few of the announcements, uh, kind of things coming up. Make sure you use your bulletins. Uh, There's a lot of information in there, and I'll just kind of highlight a a few things. Uh, May 14th, 15th, uh, we're looking at uh, associate pastor, and he's going to be here to preach that Sunday. Um, As the the elder council is kind of interviewing him, and we got to know him good, and we want to invite the whole church to kind of come in and and uh, ask questions, hear his testimony. So that'll be an interesting Sunday. That's next Sunday. Um, there's a church work day this next Saturday coming up um, from 10.30 to 1 p.m. Just uh, be aware of that. Try to get that into your schedule. And then uh, there's some mission items needed, and they're, they're kind of specific, some of them there. Uh, if you have any questions on those, um, ask uh, Jim and uh, Marge Todd about that. And just kind of that video that we were watching, you know, just talking about compassion. And I just want to kind of dive into that just a little bit more with the one verse that they brought out in Matthew 23, uh, part of the verse 37. And Jesus is talking to uh, Jerusalem and he says, How often I would gather gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. And just like the mother hen, you know, puts her wing around, around the chicks, and protecting them with her body, Jesus Christ, he went to the cross and used his body to protect us there from the wrath of God if we'd be willing uh, to surrender to him. So just kind of uh, for starting out here, for uh, the, uh, getting into the, the worship, we just want to kind of bring our minds to that and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be here. We're thankful for the, for the mothers, the Mothers that, uh, even if they did not have children, that they have adopted children, and Father, that uh, they would take uh, kids in their uh, circles as in as their kids, Father, and, and love them and, and teach them about you, Father. We're just so thankful for, for all the mothers, and Father, we just uh, we want to worship you here today, and for you are worthy, and, and we want to worship you in song, and, and we want this day to be honorable to you, and Father, we just... Uh, we just bring all our cares and our troubles, and we just lay them at your feet, Father. And we just, uh, we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for our first song.
Mike Walls, I'm the missions deacon here at Christ Community. Um, if you're newer here, we try to every month, we try to highlight one of our missions partners. And um, we've done that for about eight or nine months now. And we've had a lot of them come and visit, or several of them come and visit us, and we've seen them and been able to ask questions in Sunday school. And we've had a great time getting to know some of them. 
Uh, this week, I thought we would just kind of zoom out a little bit and see why we've partnered, what's the vision for the missions team and for the church for missions. Um, so we're going to see a video um, shortly. Um, but as of right now, we're partnered with seven cross-cultural missionaries uh, as a church. And um, out of those, almost all of them are working in areas of the world that's called unreached, meaning that there's less than 1% Christian in their areas, in their countries, or in their people group that they're working with. And actually, in most places where they are, it's, it's one Christian for every 10,000 people. So these are difficult, difficult places where they're serving. It's, it's unreached for a reason. Um, it's, it's hard places. There aren't a lot of missionaries there. Um, you can see on the screen, that's the 1040 window. I don't know, some of you have probably heard of that, but it's North Africa, the Middle East, and um, Asia. And that's where 97% of the unreached people groups live. And so when Jesus said to go and make disciples of all nations, that word nations is eth uh, ta ethne, uh, which means ethnic group. So it'd be people groups like um, the Uzbeks, the Uyghurs, the Patani Malays, Somalis, North African Arabs, Middle Eastern Arabs, and Hindi-speaking Telugus. And these are all the, the people who we as a church are invested with significantly in, in reaching with the gospel. Um, the 1040 window is, it's called the 1040 window because it goes from 10 degrees north latitude to 40 degrees. Um, and that's the window where, like I say, most of the unreached, almost all of the unreached peoples live. Um, we're going to watch a short video. And as you watch it, keep in mind that there are still today about 7,000, a little over 7,000 unreached people groups that are still in the world. Um, and nearly all of them are in the 1040 window. Only 3% of missionaries globally um, are serving in these places. Actually, it's not global. 3% of American missionaries are serving in these places. And only 1% of missions giving from the American church goes to these places. Um, you can start the, the video. We're not talking about people who are lost and don't know the Lord. We're talking about people who are lost and don't know the Lord and there's nobody who speaks their language that can tell them. There is no church that exists. There is no, uh, not a large enough group of people within that people group or within that tribe or nation to, to reach themselves. That's an unreached people group. When I'm riding through the city on my bike and I just look around me and I see mobs of people mobs of people and looking into their faces and remembering to look into their faces and um, thinking, is there one of these people, do one of these people know Jesus? Probably not, probably not. If what you want to do is change people's hearts and change millions of people's hearts, this isn't something that you can do in the flesh. So prayer is really the lifeblood of our work around the city, seeing so many students around, uh, 11 and a half million people as I commute, the whole train is filled with people and the reality that, that less than 1% of them are Christian, just, uh, that's what really breaks my heart and seeing the need for the gospel here. The core of the gospel is life on life. It's people touching other people. And if there's anything we can do, it's to get the people that are, that are here, connected with the people that are there. So the last, the last bit there says you can pray, you can give, and you can go. Those are three ways that we can be involved with missions. Two of those things every one of us can do, right? We can all pray and we can all give to missions, and some of us will go. Um, I loved what he said, that prayer is the lifeblood of our work. They're just people like us, right? They can't do anything. They can't change people's hearts. And so we as a church can significantly help them through our prayers. We're, we're giving as a church. Um, but there's a few things that I want to just bring before us quickly. Um, 
if any of you want to get newsletters from any of our missionaries, um, please come to me and I can connect you. If you want to pray on a more regular basis for them, we get newsletters monthly, generally, for most of them. Um, we're also going to highlight um, at, the, at the monthly prayer meetings that Rod is, is organizing, we're gonna, I'm going to bring prayer requests. So please come and pray for them at the prayer meetings. Um, if you want to give to a specific missionary that we're supporting, come to me and, and, and I can connect you with them. One of our partners is underfunded right now, so there's plenty of needs. If you want to get more involved in, in reaching the unreached, um, please see me and I can get you more involved or help you get more involved. Um, and finally, if you have a heart to go, if your heart burns for the unreached, please come to me. We can talk. There's potential to visit our missionaries on the field or just lots of ways that, that I can maybe help you get connected. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we're going to go to prayer and pray for these things that Mike has mentioned. Um, just to let you know, the ushers will be coming forward in just a few minutes. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and prepare for the offerings as well. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to pray together, uh, to gather together under the banner of your grace and your love that is symbolized in the cross. And Lord, we thank you that you have gone to the cross to purchase a people for yourself, and, and we are now your family. Thank you for the faith that you bestowed upon us by your Holy Spirit. And as Mike has mentioned, this work is of you. It's from above, it's divine, it is heavenly. And uh, we thank you for the Holy Spirit pursuing us and seeking us out in our brokenness and our weakness and giving us that inclination, that softening of the heart to cry out to you and ask for mercy and compassion. Lord, we do pray that you would send out your Holy Spirit around the world in these last days and you would gather in a great harvest, a great harvest of souls, Lord. Lord, we would see that in our time, in our days, Lord, that we would join in that effort of praying, humbling ourselves and crying out on behalf of our nation and for those who are lost around the world. Lord, we do, we do recognize that we need a revival. It seems as if the darkness is encroaching. It's in places that it had always been pushed back and uh, managed in, in, in the power of the gospel, and we see things changing in our culture, which is always the case in every generation. But Lord, you have given us insight into the ways that we can push back and uh, do this in the power of prayer. We pray now, Lord, that you would help us in our giving, that it would be a representation of our hearts. It would not be done out of compulsion or duty, but out of love. And so receive our gifts, our offerings, our tithes, and we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.
Thank you, Susan. Well, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to 1 Samuel, taking a break from our Roman series that we can kind of encourage the moms that are in our midst and uh, focus on the God who is compassionate, as we saw earlier before the service started. Um, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 1, and um, if you're using the Pew Bible in front of you, you can find it on page 225, or if you're looking through your old Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel. Some of you memorized that as a child, right? You know the song. Um, so 1 Samuel chapter 1, we're going to be reading verse 11. And of course, as we come to this passage, it's a story about Hannah. <clears throat> and some of you are familiar with the life of Hannah, a godly woman who poured out her heart before the Lord because she was in great turmoil. And as we study this passage this morning, we do recognize that on Mother's Day, we all have kinds, all kinds of feelings and emotions that can relate to what Hannah is going through here in the text. Uh, some of us feel great gratitude as we think about our mothers. Some of us perhaps have had some bad experiences growing up, and so this day is kind of colored with some disappointment and pain. And I'm sure there are women here this morning who would like to go, uh, like to be married and are single and have not had the privilege of having children. It's a heart desire. And some of our mothers here have lost children, so you can't face Mother's Day without some pain and feeling that loss. Uh, some of you have experienced the pain of miscarriage, uh, which is a, is a very silent, private pain. Uh, most people don't know what that pain is like, and so it's a private pain that a mother has to endure. It may be that you're struggling with infertility this morning, so there's the pain of not having children, even though there is this longing. Or perhaps some of you have said goodbye to your mothers, and you're grieving the loss. Mother's Day brings all kinds of things um, to our hearts. Then certainly for all of us this morning, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're a mother or not, all of us this morning have certain burdens that we carry. And if we are honest with the Lord, we, we don't leave them at the door, right? So when you walk in here, you bring those burdens with you. You bring those sufferings that you bear in your life. You bring them into the very presence of God with honesty. And I think the story of Hannah helps us with that because here's a woman who struggled like all of us. She is a woman that struggled with infertility, and yet she brought that struggle to the Lord in prayer and saw God do some amazing things. So I want us to read just verse 11. Um, as we go, we're going to be looking at pretty much two chapters, chapter 1 and chapter 2. We're just going to read verse 11 and then ask God for some prayer. So let's look there. And Hannah vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. Father, we do thank you for this passage, and we thank you for each person here this morning. And we pray now that by your spirit you would speak and give comfort and guidance. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, how many of you are kind of watching that video as it was uh, prepping us for worship? Uh, what was the major English word that came across over and over again? It starts with a C. Compassion, right? Now, here's the funny thing about how God works. I, I had not seen that video uh, before this morning. And yet my introduction is on Rahum, <laughs> the compassion of God. It's amazing how God works those things out. That was a, a wonderful discovery that I had this, this past week as I was preparing for this sermon. I was realizing that compassion is a great theme of this text. It's a, it's a great theme throughout the scriptures. But that word for compassion in the Hebrew is literally the root word for womb. Isn't it amazing that God communicates his nature by referencing the most motherly organ in the human body? Isn't that amazing? The most motherly organ in the human body, God says, that defines who I am. I am the God of compassion. And so by using the womb to convey who he is, he's saying, I am the one of new beginnings. I am the one who gives birth to change in your life. 
There is nothing else in this world that can give you life. There is nothing else that can bring change into your home life. I am the one who gives new life, new chapters, new beginnings to you, fresh starts. And so as we think about God's nature, God, of course, calls us to mirror that nature. And so as we engage with one another in home, compassion is one of the keys. It's, it's one of those virtues that says, I give you a new start. I give you a new beginning today. And we definitely see that in the story of Hannah. And I want us to begin with her painful story. You have an outline to help us as we go. But starting in verses 1 and 2, we see the people in Hannah's life. It would be kind of like you sitting down with your journal right now and writing off all the people that are in your life. And you'd go back generations. Some of you can do that rather quickly. I am the son of so-and-so, and he is the son of so-and-so, or I am the daughter of so-and-so, and on and on. We can go back probably four or five generations for some of us here. And so the story begins with Elkanah, who is the man that is referenced here with a good pedigree. If you can say those names, <laughs> they're complicated names in the Hebrew, but Elkanah is the man with the pedigree. These verses give us four generations worth of his ancestors. And then we are given his wife, Hannah, and we are told specifically that Hannah is barren. She does not have a child, and this is the primary source of her suffering and pain. And then we're told that Elkanah has a second wife, and her name is Panina. And the text tells us that she is quite fertile. She has a number of children, sons and daughters. And of course, it's Hannah's infertility that is the source of her deepest pain. And we'll see that as the text unfolds, it's emphasized again and again. Just let me highlight a few things. Verse 8, if you have your Bible open, says, her heart was sad. Verse 10, she is deeply distressed. She weeps bitterly in verse 10. She describes her situation as affliction in verse 11. In verse 15, she says that she is troubled in spirit. And then in verse 16, her life is characterized by great anxiety and vexation. This is her situation. She's suffering. She's suffering the deep disappointment of barrenness, of infertility. But there's a lot more here than just infertility. And this pain is exasperated by several issues related to it. And that's true for all of us here this morning. If you were to put your finger on the pulse of your greatest pain, you would say, well, it's not the only pain. There are other things that are accentuating it, making it even more painful. And that's true in Hannah's life. First of all, she's feeling the weight of her culture. The weight of her culture is bearing down upon her. It's implicit when you see how this passage begins with Elkanah and his ancestors. It's a big deal to have a big family. Some of you know what that's like. You came from a home where a full quiver was, was quite the accomplishment. Amen? And that was part of the culture of that day. A full quiver meant a lot of things in that day, one of which was economic stability. Some of you have come from large families, and you know that there's a lot of work to do in a large family, especially if you live on the farm. That was true with my family. That was true with my my grandparents and their parents and way back. Um, everybody had a job to do. The economic stability of a family relied upon the working hands of those who lived in the home. So the more children you had, the greater the workforce to tend to your fields, to produce your goods, to distribute them to the community. The children were working as part of the home, part of the family. So not having children was an economic hardship as well as a, a theological um, malediction. And so before we get too quick to judge this culture back then, we have to be honest and say that some of you are bearing the brunt of your own traditions, right? Your own expectations or people that place expectations on you. Some people put weight on you, especially if you're a mom, right? Sometimes it's the mother-in-law. <laughs> you can say an amen if you want to, unless she's sitting next to you. <clears throat> But you know what it's like. You show up at your mother-in-law's house and you can feel the expectations. 
You can feel it as she watches your children play. If you have this, or if you do this, or if you accomplish this, you'll be a good mom. You'll be a success. And if you don't, you're not a successful woman. You're not a successful man. You're not a good mother. And our culture has all kinds of idols, and we tend to adopt those idols. And when those things are not happening, we feel disappointed. We may be attached more to beauty or to status or to wealth or to success or to education, whatever it is. Whatever it is in your culture, it's, it's pressing down on you. And the same is true for Hannah. Second, her infertility is intensified by the weight of a personal relationship. How many of you can relate to this? Your core, your struggle is accentuated. It's intensified by the weight of a friendship that is awry or a person in your life that, is, that has that unique ability just to slide under your skin and make things difficult for you, okay? We are told here that Panina is the rival of Hannah. That's the, that's the, the word that's given here in verse 6, the word rival. You know, Panina carries this idea of a tormentor with Hannah. Okay? Uh, and just a little side note here. Thankfully, polygamy is not very common today, but it was pretty common in the Old Testament. And anytime you read a polygamy in the Old Testament, what's interesting is it's not something that God sanctions. It's typically something that happens because of cultural expectations. It's not prescribed by the Lord. And whenever we see it mentioned, it's interesting that the Bible says it brings all kinds of misery into the people's lives that, that practice it. It's one of those practices that brings lots of misery into the lives of those who are involved. So the Bible just approves of polygamy at every turn. It always brings hardship, and it certainly has brought hardship on Hannah. And probably the reason that Elkanah married Panina was because Hannah had no children. Hannah is the one that Elkanah loved dearly. It was, this is the relationship that he really cherished. And because she was not having children, he had to go outside of the marriage, and he went to another woman which was pretty common back in that day. And, of course, because she is able to bear children, she attacks, she undermines, she assaults, she tears down Hannah. She is always undermining her sense of worth and dignity. And so that's the second weight that's pressing down on Hannah. And third, she's feeling the weight of God's providence. And some of you know what this is like. Notice the text does not shrink away from this. Look at verse 6 again. The reason why Panina is tormenting Hannah because the Lord has done what? He has closed her womb. It says he has closed her womb. And Hannah no doubt knew this. She knew that God is the one who gives life. He is the one who gives life. She knew that anyone who believes in the real God will believe that God is the one who gives life and takes life, that God is the one who can give conception or withhold it. And we know God can answer prayer, and sometimes he doesn't, and sometimes he does. We know God can give us a different set of circumstances, a different set of gifts, but he doesn't sometimes. God can open a door that he didn't open. He can provide a job that he didn't provide. He can give a spouse, but he didn't give it. He could have healed a person, and he didn't. We know these things about God. And some of you maybe have a, a real burden in your life right now, and you know that the only way that this thing can get resolved is if God hears your prayer. And not only hears it, but answers that prayer. And it's exasperated. She goes to this place of worship called the temple on a, a yearly basis. It's a pilgrimage. You go there, you worship, you, you give your sacrifice to the Lord, all of which is pointing forward to the coming Messiah. And as they make their journey as a family, as they pack up the van and head that direction, guess who's in the van with her? Her tormentor. And the tormentor is always picking at her. Isn't it interesting how religion can bring the, the worst out of people? And maybe this morning as you're getting to church, all of you are heading to the church, ready to worship God. And in the midst of all of that, 
a religious activity of coming here to worship God, you find yourself picking at each other. The kids are picking at each other. That's the weight of God's providence working in Hannah's life. I think there's some other things that are going on here, but the fourth one I would like to mention is, I believe, that she is feeling the weight of her times. She is feeling the weight of her times as well, which adds pressure to what she is going through. How many of you can say that because of the pandemic, your life has not been altered, not been changed, one iota? How many of you can say that? I don't think any of us can say it. The pandemic and all the stress and everything that happened within the homes and within extended family, with what's happened in your workplace, what's happened in the community, the people that we have said goodbye to because they have passed away as a result of the pandemic, it puts a burden on us. It puts a weight on us. And if you're attentive, if you're a good reader, and if you read 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, what were the times? What were the times like? You have to go to the book of Judges to understand the context of First and Second Samuel. But what does the book of Judges tell us about the times? What were people doing? Were they zealous for the Lord? Were they walking with the Lord? Were everyone in step, arm in arm, going to the Lord in prayer and humbly walking in their communities? What were they doing? They were doing what was right in their own eyes. There was not a king. They had these corrupt judges. And everybody was doing what seems right in their own eyes. Very much like today. You think this is unusual? Nope. The human heart has always been this way. And back in that day, everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes, which means there was lots of selfishness. There was lots of twisted corruption in the judicial system. There was lots of fear, lots of anxiety, very little hope in the air. All the moorings that anchor a nation are being pulled up. Lots of things are in question. Hedonism, left and right. Lots of wokeness. Lots of vengeance. Lots of violence. All these things are happening. And that is the times in which she lives. This is the story of her sorrow and her suffering. This is the reality that Hannah must deal with. This is her home life. This is what she has been given. And so the question is, how will she respond? Right? That's the question that you're wrestling with as well. How should I respond to all of this? Now, have you ever noticed the, the advertisements and the commercials have answers for us? Hey, just join the, you know, join the wine of the month club and just drink a little more wine. Enjoy a little more wine on the weeknights and on the weekends. It kind of numbs the pain. It takes away some of the anxieties that we have because of life. Some may interpret all of this, all of this weighing down, as a sign, you know what? God doesn't love me. How many of you have ever felt that way? God doesn't love me. He doesn't care. He's just not interested in me. You lay awake wondering, what have I done to deserve this? right? You pull away from God. You get angry with God. Some of you might even say, I'm, a, I'm this close to being done with God. If this is what it means to walk with him, to serve him, I'm ready to walk. And perhaps Hannah did some of this, right? Perhaps she did some of this. Maybe she had some struggles for quite a long time. I wouldn't be surprised, I know some godly women that are sitting here that have had those same responses in hardship and trials. Amen? But what response produced the kind of outcome that she ultimately desired? What response produced the kind of outcome that she ultimately desired and ultimately it pleased the Lord? We've got we to wake up. We've got to say, hey, what is the response that elicited the kind of care that I need from God. And these two chapters tell us, by faith, Hannah seeks the compassion of the Lord. 
She goes after the compassion of the Lord. She asked for a rebirth. She's taking this deep pain and this deep suffering to the Lord. And she cries out to God for help. And through this act of giving her troubles to the Lord and seeking his compassion, something is birthed. Amen? Something changes. And this change in her life is going to lead to hope and healing, not just for her own soul, but for the whole nation of Israel. Because who does she give birth to? She eventually gives birth to a son named Samuel. And Samuel is called to be this prophet in the nation of Israel. He is to be the kingmaker. He will anoint King David. He will be, of course, the great ancestor to the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David. So Hannah's pain, and more importantly, what she does with it, plays a very crucial role in her life and the course of all human history. You don't think you're, do you think you're the exception to that? Your pain and your suffering is meant to give birth to something that not only blesses your life, but blesses the next generation. Amen? That's how God works. And that's how God works through mothers. It's an amazing reality. How many of you this morning can say, I need a rebirth? I need change. Can I hear an amen? I need change in my life. I need a rebirth. I need something to come into my life that can only be done by God. That has to come from the womb of God's compassionate heart. To see how this works, take a look at uh, Hannah's prayer. In chapter 1, 9 through 10, we read, After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. And she was deeply distressed, and she prayed to the Lord, and she wept bitterly. This prayer becomes the turning point for Hannah. And when you look through the rest of this next paragraph, you see prayer all over the place. She makes a vow in verse 11. And then there is this contrast between Hannah and Eli that is the context of her heart longing. This is quite interesting if you, if you just pay attention here. Eli thinks that she's what? Drunk. Eli thinks that she's been drinking. She belongs to the wine of the month club. And he's probably seen this quite often. This is how people cope with their pain. You just buy a big case of beer and you drink it until you don't feel anything anymore. And you cozy up to your buddies and your friends and you go through it together. That's the response that Eli has been seeing for quite some time in his generation. Her lips are moving, but there's nothing coming out of her mouth. In other words, Eli is probably used to seeing this, and, 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 and she's praying, though, okay? She's not using words. She's just mouthing the words, but she's praying. And we are told, you know, sometimes you think the priest or the pastor is the exception to the rule, but Eli was just like his times. Eli does this as well, okay? Eli's got the same kind of response, But what's Hannah's response? She says, no, pastor, (laughs) I haven't been drinking. In fact, I've, I've poured out. I'm not taking in. I have poured out. I have poured out my soul to the Lord. That's what she says to Eli. You see, the Bible is giving us a contrast between Eli, who is this lazy, lethargic, really, really loves food kind of guy, and it shows. He's this priest who has no rule over his internal world, over his own appetites, and it shows in his family, if you keep reading, his sons are rascals and scoundrels. You know, when they have the the sacrifices and they're boiling it in hot water, they come along with their big forks, and they take whatever they can carry on that big fork. That's what they do, okay? And that's Eli's family. But the Bible wants to see that what a humble person does with her pain. 
What does Hannah do with her pain? The Bible wants us to see that she pours it out. She pours it out to God. Hannah's prayer is characterized by these deep emotions, this deep, deep pain, but also this deep confidence in who God is. Okay? Deep confidence in who God is. And so this confidence enables her to be honest and raw with God. I don't have to pretend here. I can say what's on my heart. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be an ugly cry, whatever. But I can give it to God because I have confidence in who God is. And what does she see about God that enables her to have this vulnerability with him? She has great confidence in his sovereignty. You can see that in chapter 2 throughout the prayer, the lengthy prayer, that almost um, is the prayer of Mary. If you go to the New Testament, Mary seems to really (sighs) borrow a lot from Hannah. But throughout this prayer in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, you see this great confidence in God's sovereignty. She comes to God, who is the Lord of hosts. He is the Lord of the armies. He is this great and mighty God. And this great song of praise in chapter 2 expresses great confidence in his sovereignty. It's just chuck full of his glory. It's just chuck full of his goodness and his mercy. She sees the sovereignty of God over her life. And that enables her. That truth emboldens her. Friends, if you don't see as a God who's in charge, why would you pray to him? Amen? Why would you call upon a God who has no control or no power over all things? You're going to hang back. You're going to try to turn to other means. You're going to try to figure it out, work it out with your own grit and determination. She knows she can't fix this problem. She cries out to the sovereign God. Great confidence in this. Second, Hannah has confidence in God's nearness. She knows that God will listen to her. He's a sovereign God, but he's a near God. He is close to the brokenhearted. And that's exactly the kind of heart we should have as we come to prayer. We should have a great confidence in God's mercy and his desire to listen. To listen to your heart. And when we don't have confidence that God is able and willing to to listen, our prayers are hindered. In essence, we insult God. We insult him with our demands. We do him an injustice. You see, this trust in in his sovereignty and in his nearness inspires her, enables her to be broken and to surrender. Tap out. And we see the surrender in her prayer. Look at verse 11. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will do what? I will give him to the Lord, not just for a couple of weeks, not just for a couple of years, but I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. Now, how many of you have ever prayed to God and you found yourself bargaining, right? You're praying to God, and God, if you do this for me, then I'll do this for you, right? If you give me $100,000, I'll give half of it to the church. Just help me to pay down this debt, whatever it might be. We bargain with God. Is this a bargain with God? Is Hannah bargaining with God? On the surface, it kind of looks like she is, but it's not. She's making a vow. And there is a difference between a bargain and a vow. And her vow is essentially to make her son a Nazarite so that he will join the temple community and be devoted to ministry for his entire life. Now, here's the interesting thing about this this vow. In giving her son to the work of the Lord, she is denying herself of every cultural, personal idol that is pressing in and around her. Do you see this? This son would represent all the things that she lacks. The compassionate, 
the companionship of children. She's willing to give that away. The economic benefit of children in her community, she's vowing to give that away. A child to carry the name of her husband, which is huge in that day. She's vowing to give that away. The religious status that comes with being a mom in this time, she's giving it away. Does this register? Does this make any sense? And here's the thing, she's willing to give it all up. All this cultural significance, all this religious significance of motherhood, she's willing to give it all up and devote to the Lord. And she does. She does. As soon as the child is weaned, she takes him to the temple and he is devoted there to the Lord. And she surrenders the very thing that she wants most. She gives him to the Lord and the very thing that her culture and her family and everyone around would say, if you only had this, you'd be happy. She gives it to the Lord. Why? How can we be in that kind of place? Because she had another confidence in God. She had confidence in his compassion. His compassion. We see one last note of confidence, and it is confidence in his compassion. This is the fruit in Hannah's story. This is the fruit in her story. In chapter 2, 1 through 10, she devotes him to the Lord. She gives him to the Lord. Go home and read the prayer. It's weighty. And it's full of compassion. It's full of God's compassion. God delights in a woman's open hands, a woman's open heart, a woman's complete surrender. This is Hannah's story. And Hannah's story tells us that God delights in putting gifts in open hands. Now we can't rush We can't rush between drawing a straight line between that which we pray and that which God gives. All of that is in his wisdom and his guidance. But we do certainly see throughout the scriptures that God delights in putting gifts in open hands. That's what we ultimately see. Ralph Davis is an Old Testament commentator and he puts it this way. Every time God lifts you out of the miry bog and sets your feet upon a rock, it is a sample of the coming of the kingdom of God, a down payment on the full deliverance, the macro salvation that will be yours and mine. And so to conclude, for all the women here who are dearly loved by the Lord, that is my great hope for you this day. It is my great hope for all of the men here who just get to listen in. You see, through Hannah came Samuel. And Samuel was the prophet of the Lord. And he was the kingmaker who anointed Saul and then anointed David. And because of David being the great, great, great grandfather to Jesus, Jesus, through the womb of a woman named Mary, lives the perfect life bears the weight of all our guilt and shame upon a cross, dies there, facing the wrath of God so that we would not, is buried, is raised on the third day. All of this is God's gift to you, the ultimate gift, and he places it in your hands and in your heart when it is open. And so every mother here, as we've seen in Romans From the very beginning of Romans to the very end of Romans, you see it. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. If you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, this ultimate gift to those who have open hearts, there is no condemnation, Mom. There is none. A friend of mine who is a a blogger put it this way, there is no condemnation. You are not condemned by your messy home. You are not condemned by your lack of desire to homeschool. 
You are not condemned by your personal sins, by your miscarriages, by your lack of desire to have more kids, by your inability to cook, by your body, which may not be what it once was, by your repeated failures as a mother, by all the fears and tears which flirt with insanity and take you to the precipice of despair. You are not condemned by your need for a vacation without the kids. You're not condemned. <laughs> For not living up to the standards of your mother or your mother-in-law. You are not condemned. Amen? Enjoy the compassion of the Lord. Enjoy the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Live in the grace and in the light of his favor every single day of your life. Mothers, even though you may feel condemned, if you are in Christ, you are not condemned. That is your reality. Pour out your heart to your Father who art in heaven. The prayers of a mother change the course of history. And that includes your prayers. Would you pray with me? Gracious and merciful Father, this morning we look to you in your sovereign goodness and your fatherly providence. And we look to you in the mystery of your plan. And I pray for each mother here every woman here, every man here. Father, thank you for your compassion that has been bestowed on us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Do the work of grace this week, this day. We pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Please stand.
receive the Lord's blessing, the blessing for you this day. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine down upon you, be gracious to you, and lift up his countenance and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.